Okay, good evening, uh, everyone, um, to the December meeting of the uh, Reeking Branch of the I Agree. Um, yeah, so this evening, as we can see in front of us now, we've got uh, uh, Will Tua, who's uh, going to uh, give a presentation on his work and, and thoughts on uh, uh, anaerobic digestion. Um, I think the usual sort of pack drill is that if we uh, go keep ourselves on mute, we can either um, put questions in the chat and I'll, we'll try and sort of pick those up later and perhaps we'll have a sort of a discussion uh, after Will's uh, uh, sort of presentation, as you might say. So with no further ado, I'll hand over to Will and uh, let him carry on. Uh, good evening and welcome everybody. And firstly, thank you to the Reekin branch for inviting me virtually to do this presentation. So this evening, I'm going to talk about anaerobic digestion. And as you can see from the title, I've titled it a volatile business um, for many reasons. And so in the presentation, I'm going to go through sort of all the aspects uh, of what AD is about and how AD businesses work, the feedstocks, um, the energy, etc. So yeah, if you've got if you've got questions, if you keep them, um, either raise a hand or take them to the end. But I'll move forward now to the first slide. So, so I'm William Tewer. Um, I'm a member of the I Agree and I Eng, uh, and I'm a, a Cumbrian farmer's son. Uh, from Central Cumbria. And I set off my engineering career really um, at age 12 to 13 at a very small John Deere franchisee in the village of Crosby Ravensworth, uh, who used to sell, I think, about five tractors a year. He then lost the John Deere franchise. I then carried on then and went to do a ND in agricultural engineering at the now unfortunately closed Newton Rigg College, um, and then on to Harper in 2001. So this is now my, uh, I'm now 20 years since I went to Harper this year, and I studied HND in engineering design and development and um, with a placement at John Deere. So following on from my HND, I went to work for John Deere and I was there for a decade and I, I worked in various um, parts of the business and the sector. I started off in the commercial and utility side on product demonstrations then product training and then sales training. I then moved into product support, uh, which was probably one of the most interesting positions I held there. And I, and I worked initially um, being a service specialist for balers and mocos covering the UK and Ireland. I then took on foragers, and then I took on what is the remote or advanced diagnostics tool, which is service advisor. And then uh, as DIA restructured, I, I took on some other English speaking countries. So I, I offered cover to parts of the Americas uh, and parts of John Deere International uh, for the harvesting product line. And then latterly, I moved um, back to the UK to, to do a territory manager's role. Uh, and I did, I think four and a half years as a territory manager in the north of UK and sorry, north of England and Southern Scotland, where I managed eight dealers with 14 outlets and a, a turnover of sales turnover of between 25 and 30 million in sales at that time. Then towards the end of that, I'd always been interested in renewables. Um, I'd been interested in anaerobic digestion when I was working with John Deere in Germany and parts of Europe. Uh, I'd seen the development of their harvest lab technology, which focused on the analysis of crops, uh, especially into AD, uh, but just generally interested in uh, renewables. And, and as I was getting to an age where I'd just started a family, um, I wanted to move back, uh, spend a bit more time with the family and my wife. Um, I flitted around in 2014, I had a brief spell at a dealer, and then I was I was asked to go and work for a company called AWS Power Limited, and they were a franchisee for a anaerobic digestion company based in Austria, um, Biogest AG. And I took up that role under the prefix of doing technical sales um, across northern UK and Ireland in AD, feedstock consultancy and grid connections. And during that period of 2014 to 2018, I immersed myself in AD. Uh, I did a commercial waste qualification to WAMITAB in AD. 
uh, and I did some other commercial qualifications in waste uh, management. And I was involved in around about seven um, developments and, and building of AD plants and specifically two developments right from conception to actual commissioning. But unfortunately, during that time, our funders, um, so we were backed by several large funding organisations. One of them took um, the AD company to uh, arbitration. Uh, and I ended up as a, as a key witness in that. And that was a, an interesting experience or an interesting part of my life for two years. And that's just recently been resolved. Uh, thankfully successfully but it was uh, I learned a lot from that experience uh, both positively and negatively and then in 2019 I've been working with two individuals first uh, I have a business partner Alistair Wanneth at Carlisle who owns and operates a 1.1 megawatt AD plant on energy crop and a gentleman called John Cunningham Jardine who had a one megawatt plant at Dumfries and they sort of encouraged me to, to go into the business myself and they would offer me some work. So in 2019, I set up my company, WST Rural, which did which does work in AD and feedstock advisory. I also do some small business sort of strategy of engineering bits and pieces in the sideline. And aside to that, um, I'm a corner in a company called One Up Natural Products, where we, we have a brand called Will and Isles Natural Plant Food Company. Uh, and we sell plant food into consumers on Amazon. Uh, and we're a chosen uh, preferred supplier in Amazon, what's called a launch pad um, company within Amazon. Uh, and I'll talk about these all a little bit later. I'm also a committee member of Yadmos Ski Club, which is um, England's premier real ski club. So we have a, uh, we have a facility on uh, Burn Up Seat, which is one of the one of the higher peaks of the Pennines near Alston. Uh, I've recently just stepped down as a director of that business, but I did seven years as a director, uh, looking at various things from health and safety to engineering. We have a we have a drag lift which was um, which was bought secondhand from Austria. Uh, we have a secondhand peace basher, and we have a clubhouse, uh, and I'm also a chairman uh, of our local club. But also behind it is I've always been heavily involved in the family farm and the family business. So if I move forward, talk a little bit about my work and then we'll move into the, the world of anaerobic digestion. So really, as myself, I split my time up three ways. Um, firstly, my business, which is WST Rural, which I look at, uh, look after AD. So I, I solely look after uh, one AD plant at Dumfries, and then I offer management and consultancy, as well as a lot of biological advice across a handful of varied AD plants um, in the north. Uh, I build some apps um, with, a, with a gentleman, um, with, which we can take data from them sites, uh, also a couple of contractors use it, so maybe where they want to record daily checks, and we build them into a, a server-based system. Then. The next part of my role is with the Will and Al's Natural Plant Food Company, where we, we retail plant food made from uh, digestate. So we put that through a process. Uh, we, it gives us two products, a solid product and a liquid product. And we have some different varieties of that. And I'll talk about that later. And then finally, the family farm. So I've been through the rigmarole of a, an upland mixed farm where we had a little bit of arable, uh, beef and sheep, but re really in the last, 10 to 15 years, that business has diversified heavily. Uh, we now have um, some holiday cottages. We have a campsite. We have camping pods, shepherd's huts, and a camping barn. And we've recently just finished a, a, a project with one of um, a couple of farms in the UK where we've actually gone and done some water flooding mitigation work, which takes up between 40 and 60 acres of the farm uh, to prevent flooding further down the valley. We, we live in a very high rainfall area near Shap, uh, and we've been a pilot scheme with the local water body uh, to look at water mitigation measures to slow the flow of water off, off the farmland, which is a slightly um, curveball um, situation because we have had to take some land out of agricultural production, but that will go into a more regenerative agricultural uh, production scheme. 
We, we currently uh, produce quite a lot of hay, uh, natural hay, organic hay. We don't call it organic because we're not officially organic, but it's non-fertilized and we have some hay meadows. So that's really a little bit about myself. And now to the important part, so anaerobic digestion. So I've chosen a picture really for my first slide, which I think is one of my fav most favorite AD plants. And, and this is a, a, would be described as a small AD plant. It's a single tank. I'm gonna talk a lot more about AD. So uh, I'll come into more details, but I've just picked what's, what I think is one of my most favorite type of AD plants. So this is a 120 kilowatt AD plant located on a, uh, a dairy farm north of Carlisle. And, and it runs purely on the waste products from that farm. So the waste silages, the slurries and the manures, and it's producing sufficient electricity to, to power the farm, which is a, a high welfare, indoor housed on robots um, farming system. And they take the biogas from the AD plant you can see on the roof, burn it in the CHP and produce around about 120 kilowatts per hour of power, which goes into the farm and the local grid and plus around about 150 kilowatts of thermal heat units, uh, which are used to heat the AD plant, do some bits and pieces on the farm. And the farmer that now has a, has a drying business where he's drying logs, uh, some contract drain and some other bits and pieces. So to the interesting question, I hope this isn't uh, too rudimentary, but I'm gonna go through lots of bits of AD. So the basics of AD, how it works, how the finances work. So if we start on the first part, so what is anaerobic digestion? Well, basically it's a four stage process where we take organic material, we break and it's broken down by bacteria or microorganisms in the absence of air. Now there's quite a few more things behind that, but that really is the basis. And that takes place in a four stage process. We really, each of the stages after the first process interlinked. So the hydrolysis is the, the first process where we break down initially that material which is put into the AD plant. And then we have the acegenes, the atogenics and the methogenics. Really, I'm not gonna to talk too much because it, it's actually quite complicated this whole process, but as, as we go through the presentation, you'll see how they're linked. Really the most important part is the methogenic um, part of the process. And that's at the ending part of the process, and that's where we produce the biogas. Um, and biogas is obviously a mix of various gases and, and particulates, um, but it's a four stage process. So this is quite a rudimentary schematic, but I thought it's the easiest way to, to look at how AD works or the theory of how it works. Because I think as we, we look back on the AD industry, uh, and as from our personal experience, I've seen lots of positives, but I've also seen lots of negatives or disasters. Um, so I'm going to look at and talk around how an AD plant works. So basically what we do is we take liquid or a solid product or a combination and we feed it into an AD plant. And that could be of a, a tank design. Uh, it could be multi-tank. But the important thing there is it's an in controlled environment. So it's controlled in temperature, moisture, and time. And the result from that gives us two products. It gives us biogas and it gives us digestive. And if we break that down further, we then can look at from the biogas stream, we can take off electricity by burning the biogas. We can have biomethane, which is a product we can inject into the grid. And then we have newer things coming online, such as carbon dioxide or to a degree, some hydrogen. And then finally, we have digested. Now, I will look at these things more individually as we go through the presentation. But firstly, I want to talk about really how do we operate an AD plant and what are the important things. Now, I could probably do a whole presentation on this. So I've had to try and cut out lots of bits and pieces and, and, and link it together into what I see as three main aspects of how I would how I operate a, an AD plant and how, how some of our businesses operate it and sort of the key indicators we look for in, in achieving consistent biogas production. And first of all, we have biological aspects, we then have feeding aspects, and then we have mechanical aspects. And when we look at biological aspects, we're looking at some basic things such as temperature level and pH, or we're looking at some more advanced things, so FOSTAC. And FOSTAC is a chemical equation which we can do on site using the machine. 
and it looks at the available energy in the feedstock versus the available bacteria or, or the buffering capacity within the digester in the plant and how that reacts and how available that feedstock is. Then we look at the biogas. So we can see we can look at the methane, the oxygen, the hydrogen sulfide, the carbon dioxide, and maybe we'll look further on at some, some of the other um, makeup of biogas. We would look at VFAs, so volatile fatty acids, so the makeup of that digestive. And these are all really important because what in AD it is so important to almost consider the trend. An AD plant works best when it's consistently fed, it's consistently heated, and it's kept at a very stable point. Uh, and that's where it's really important to look at how you measure an AD plant and what you do. And for example, here you can see some screenshots. So on some of the plants I work with, we have them on a cloud-based system where operators will take some manual and automatic readings every day, which allows us to interpret what that plant is doing. Um, so we can look at, for example, the FOSTAC, we can look at other data such as pH, and then importantly, we can look at some mechanical aspects, such as what are the mixers doing in the AD plant. And mixers I find are really good. Um, they, if you can get into a mixer and look at its amps ratings and its speed and, and its resistances, it can tell you a lot about the health of the plant, especially if you analyze it over a period of time. Then we move to some maybe more rudimentary things here. So you can see, I've got a picture here of two piles of digestive or poop as people re refer to them to. And, and then in the middle, there's a device and some of you may recognize that and that's just simply a concrete sump tester. Now I use that, I've been using it for around about a year and I have some operators now using it and we find it is a fantastic tool because anything with AD also comes down to observation. So the observation of what is happening with your digestive uh, within the plant. And it's a great tool for people to use and understand. And I generally use it a couple of times a week uh, when I'm visiting plants. Uh, with operators, we, we put um, maybe different types of digestive at different stages of the AD plant through this to understand what the, what the digestive looks like. So how does it, how does it smell? Uh, and, and how does it look? So it's viscosity, uh, what lumps are there in, the, in it, and, and also it's colour. And these are all kind of things which, when you talk to, some, for example, a herd manager, he's probably looking at when he's, in, when he's involved with cow, um, cows. So very similar. But then we move on to maybe the more advanced things. And at the bottom here, I've got a picture. Uh, and this is an analysis which is done on a couple of plants. Um, and this is FM Bioenergy who are part of the Four Farmers Group, where they take samples uh, and they go away for, for biological analysis and they look a little bit more deeply at what's happening in, within that digestate. So have we got buildup uh, of certain acids? Uh, have we got changes in pH? And these are all very important to understand. And then finally, we look at feeding aspects. So when we talk about feeding, we could talk about waste byproducts, uh, and I'll talk about them shortly in another slide. But we, we consider uh, sort of three main things, uh, which is organic loading rate. So that's um, how much organic material or volatile material we are feeding per cubic meter of usable AD space. Uh, and that's where it comes on to volatile solids, because that's really important is when we're trying to feed a plant consistently, we want to feed it consistently with usable energy. So out of that total fresh matter, what is usable? And then we've got retention time. And so from some plants, that's really important. So that's for how long, theoretically, that material which is placed in the plant stays in the plant. And so how long does it have to release its energy and how long does the bacteria have to, to process that to create the biogas? Which leads us on to biogas. And I'll try to put together a slide which is hopefully gives you a bit of perspective about biogas. So biogas is made up of, of several things, but first and foremost, biogas varies greatly depending on uh, what type of plant you operate. So you can see on the table, uh, I've used this, um, it's really useful. It gives you an idea of the variety of biogases and how they can vary greatly uh, across different AD plants. So first of all, farm AD plant and a centralized AD plant, which is waste or co-waste, uh, landfill, then sewerage, and then an example on 
um, liquid gas at an EU spec. So when we look at biogas, it's mainly made up of two things, which is methane and carbon dioxide, but then we have some other products in it. We have oxygen, nitrogen, and ammonia. We have a lot of water vapor, and within that water vapor, we can also have particulates. So if we consider that, it actually is bio, biogas is a, a relatively dirty product in its raw form. It's saturated with uh, condensate, which is uh, acidic and, and cause lots of problems when it's burned. So the first stage of any biogas system on an AD plant is to, is to manage in the hydrogen sulfide, which is very corrosive and very damaging, but also, also damaging to the bacteria in the plant itself. Uh, and the main ways that we do that before we burn biogas is we cool it and we condense it. And in that cooling process, we can, we can water vapor drops out and that takes with it some of the particulate matter. But if we look beyond that, at, for example, biomethane, biomethane is much cleaner, obviously. Um, it's mainly made up of methane, but then it has some additional things in it. So depending on the specification of where we put that into the national grid, and that's often dictated to um, depending where you connect, it might have, for example, propane added to it uh, to increase essentially its octane rating and possibly it, would, it will have an odorant also put inside it uh, so that you can smell it if there's a leakage in the system. So biogas really in its rudimentary form is quite a, a sort of a, a poor gas might be the word and we have to do a lot with it uh, to make it better. And as you can see from the table, bi biogas varies greatly. And actually, depending on how you run your plant and the feedstock has a great effect upon how clean your biogas is. And I guess part of the art of running a plant well is being able to control the biogas composites correctly without having to do a lot of outside work on it. Um, so for example, keeping the hydrogen sulfide to a lower level because hydrogen sulfide can come from uh, nitrogens in feedstocks that then reacts in the plant and produces hydrogen sulfide it produces and then eventually ammonia so there's lots of things we have to do in a plant operation to manage the biogas to get it to a level and also even a couple of percent improvement in methane it can be a great um, advantage on operating an engine i know from the plants i work with if we see a two or three percent reduction in methane percentage, so normally you would expect biogas in a farm-based system to be between 52 and 56% methane. As we get down to the 52, the 51, and then to the, into, the, into the late 40s, we can see a, a quite a big reduction in efficiency on an engine. And then we lead to misfiring uh, and just generally things don't work as well. So, so the, some of the key sort of KPIs of AD plant management is, is feedstock management at the front, then biological management, and then the management of the biogas that comes out of the plant. I'm slightly jumping off sort of the, the, the engineering and biological topic, but I think it's important to, to consider what actually is the main financial drivers for AD plants. And AD plants have generally been built in the UK based on government subsidy or tariff. Uh, and that could be, for example, the first, which was renewable obligations. Then we've got feeding tariff, where you paid per kilowatt of generation. And feeding tariff has been probably the most populist mechanism for AD plant um, development in the UK. Uh, that's now finished now, but we would see a majority, probably over half of all, the, all AD plants in the UK have been built under the feeding tariff um, legislation. And then again, for the heat use, under the RHI, so renewable heating subsidy, where we can use the heat from the CHPs, so combined heat and power, which uh, the, the engines which burn the biogas to create the electricity, we can use the excess heat from them to do something with it. I'll talk a little bit more on that shortly. And then the latest incentive, which we, we don't have a full amount of detail on yet, and this is yet to be fully released, is the government proposal on green gas incentive. So that's where uh, you would be potentially paid for injecting gas into the grid. Um, and there's still some debate going on and still legislatively changes going on that. So they're the real main uh, financial sort of underpinnings of an AD plant. 
Then after that, we look at what would be maybe seen as free market or open market drivers. And first and foremost, and actually really important, and I'll talk a little bit more detail on the next side, is a PPA electrical export. Because I think at the moment, we're all seeing electricity prices going up. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. Then we've got gate fee, and that's really a waste driven part. So that's maybe where you as an AD operator will take uh, tons of material or litres of material from a, a waste producer. You will charge them to get rid of it. And that's referred to as a gate fee. Then we have heat usage. So for example, you may be able to sell your heating into a district heating system or contract drying. Contract drying tends to be the most popular mechanism, the easiest to administrate. A lot of plants I work with are contract drying various products from paper waste uh, to create drying products, digestates, uh, wood chip, um, miscanthus, you know, varying, varying things they can do with that. Then we have electrical usage, which is I would consider different to the PPA. But for example, if you have a, uh, an AD plant and then 500 meters across the field um, on the industrial estate, you have a, a factory you would maybe strike up an agreement to provide them with a private wire. So where we talk private wire, it is where we can provide a private network, electricity to, to that site. And then finally, which is probably the most recent aspect, is gas sales. And for example, the first is methane. And we've seen in previous IAGRI presentations where, for example, methane tractors coming along. Um, so we've seen more marketplaces, methane vehicles. And then we've got biomethane, carbon dioxide and then i suspect as we as we go along this journey we will see that list of gas products which come from ad uh, growing for example maybe hydrogen or, or other things um, but that they're the main real sort of points of where money is made and how an ad plant funds itself so potential feedstock for ad and I've broken them down into really sort of three main sectors. Um, the first being waste products. Um, so we've got sewages, food waste. And when I say non-primary food waste, that's secondary food waste out of restaurants, processing facilities. So food waste, which is maybe co-mixed with other products. Um, we've got animal byproducts. We've got manures and slurries from various sources. Now, this list is just exemplary. So there's obviously lots of things. And then we move into an area which is always quite a, a big grey area in the AD world, which is byproducts. So is it a waste? Isn't it a waste? Uh, and for example, we've got animal feed manufacturing products. We've got spent grains and kernels. Whey permeate, which is a, a product comes out of the, the dairy industry. Uh, distillery products such as draft, which comes out of the whiskey distillery. And then secondary fats and proteins, which have maybe come from processing of waste in, in, in other aspects. And then finally, sort of to the core um, energy crops, we've got the most well-known. So for example, maize silages and some people maize grain. We've got whole crops um, and we've got hybrid rye, which is a relatively, I wouldn't say a new product, a new um, crop, but it, it's, it's reasonably recent in the UK into AD. And then grass silages, energy beets, uh, lucerne. And you'll see in the pictures I've got, so my three, I've got four, uh, Five examples here. So the obvious one, slurry. Uh, I've got a nice silage bit of grass silage. Uh, I've got a trailer full of that's actually um, that's finishing pigs uh, on straw. Uh, provide an interesting product that get quite a lot of biogas off that, but then get an issues with a lot of nitrogen in it. Uh, then we have a that's actually a hybrid rye uh, straight after harvesting, just as it's going into in siling. And then finally, a picture, and that's actually a port in the UK, uh, and that is uh, one of the largest importers of um, maize products into the UK for both um, into the food industry and into the animal feed industry. And you'll see on the pile, we get lumps. Uh, and and, and I, was, uh, I was actually at that site to, to try and value what them lumps are worth. So for example, that uh, importer will, will take that product, it will sieve it, put it into wagons, send it off into food production, but they're left with them lumps where the materials maybe got wet as it's been unloaded from the, um, from the container ship, not from the, from the bulker uh, into the shed. So there's a, there's a whole mix of products I come across in my job. 
Uh, but most importantly, really behind this is when we look at the waste products across the energy products is, is what do we need to do with it? So pasteurization, so to make it safe, either post or pre AD and cost and usable energy. And I'm going to look at that in a little bit more detail now. And I've broken this down into, again, three main parts, which when I look at AD to consider from a feedstock perspective, first of all, is biological aspects, then it's performance, and then it's financial. And when we're looking at biological aspects of the feedstock, and this goes really for all types of feedstock, whether it be a byproduct, a waste, or an energy crop. So what is its energy density? And that can be looked at in, for example, metabolic energy, uh, sugars and proteins. What's its dry matter? Is it a liquid or a solid? Uh, is, it, is it a liquid with a high dry matter? And importantly behind that, then, what is its organic dry matter? So how usable it is? Because we often find a lot of products we get at high dry matter can also have a high ash content. And I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, hence why volatile solids, and my word volatile, is I always find is very apt for AD because it, the principle of feeding an AD plant is giving it volatile material, but AD plants in themselves are very volatile, both biologically and financially. Uh, then we look at performance. So we look at gas yield, we look at yield timeline. So how quickly or how long does that product take to deliver its biogas in the biogas in the AD plant environment? Digestibility, how much of that product can actually we get that usable energy from? Uh, and that's another effect that we can find, for example, a high ash content product. That ash can be in the form of a lignin, which protects the embodied energy in that crop. So it can be released in the AD system and it needs secondary processing, which brings us on to financial. So financial, again, do we pay for the crop or could we get a gate fee for it? Uh, what is it cost per tonne or per cube? And very importantly, is it something we can use under license from Ofgem? So for each AD plant, which is, for example, feeding tariff and RHI, you have to go through a carbon calculator to look at the, the, the carbon footprint of that crop before it's used as a feedstock. Uh, and that's something that's important, especially if it's an energy crop, to make sure you meet a certain criteria. And then finally, does it require any additional processing? And that can bring quite substantial costs to an AD business. You might get a really good high energy product, but actually to get it to work in the AD plant, it can require lots of processing. And I do come across some really nice high energy uh, byproducts, certainly, but then actually to get them to, to work and to co-feed with other feedstocks and mix it requires a lot of, for example, grinding. So I have several sites where they need to grind a lot of their crop in commercial grinders to create it into a powdered product, which opens up the, the energy availability. If we look then, I've got two real simple tests here, which, which we do, um, and, and people who are in AD will recognize these. And so they're just a simple biogas test, but I think they represent two extremes of um, the spectrum. And these are two energy crops. So the first one we can see here has a moisture of 59.9% or 40.1% dry matter on a relatively low ash level. Um, and it's given us as a gas yield. So this is theoretical gas yield. I actually think these are probably done under an NRI, uh, their NRM uh, analysis. And it's giving us uh, a gas yield of 215.2 cubes of biogas um, per fresh matter. And then we look below it, we can see here things aren't particularly good. Um, we've, got a, we've got a dry matter of 17.4, we've got an ash of 8.2, and we've got a gas yield of 90.6. And that crop there is actually a, a grass silage. Um, the top one is a, is a whole crop wheat, uh, both taken in the same year off the same farm. But the grass silage, if I was to draw some very simple uh, sort of analogies from it, 17.4, it's, it's out of spectrum really, it's, it's too wet. Uh, it's got a high ash content, which would suggest it's probably a late season crop or it's a late grass, so it's gone past its maturity. Uh, hence why gas yield is very low, but also it's probably harvested not at ideal conditions. And, and I would have to say, I think the analysis from that, we went on to do some further analysis, that was quite butyric. Um, so on that site, we were only able to feed that at a rate of 2% to the whole diet when it would have been normally fed at around about 25 to 30% of the total diet. 
So that individual had to fetch in another crop to compensate for one, the lack of energy, but provide a balance against that butyric loading, which would come from using that crop because you either have to make a decision, does he go and dispose of that crop, spread it, uh, try and compost it. Um, there's obviously a couple of thousand tons of that in a silage pit and they're the challenges we've come up, we, we, we've come up against. And in the three pictures I picked out, these the two pictures here were taken um, last week when I was on a site. Um, so the first one I thought was a really, it's a really good picture of some uh, second cut grass silage taken in I think mid to late June. Um, so we, we can, by looking at it, I can see, I could smell it. So general observations when I go to sites is to smell the feedstock, that can tell me a lot. But it's got, it's got some good characteristics in being its colour. I could tell by the pit face it'd been well ensiled, it's gone through the ensiling process very good. Uh, it had a really good sweet smell to it, uh, the level of stickiness of when you squeeze it, but no moisture was going to come out of it. So probably just at the upper end of the acceptability on dry matter. Um, but we can see we've got good chop length and we've got good leaf disturbance. So when we talk about leaf disturbance, um, grass in itself is, is quite a hydrophobic product. It doesn't like um, it doesn't like liquid, it'll deflect it. So when you ensile it, you do break that down a little bit. But when you put it in an AD plant, naturally it wants to deflect the liquid and thus the bacteria. Uh, so we need to chop it very short to give it to give more access into that. But also if we can damage it. Um, in the process without lose, losing too much energy while we're wilting in the field, that will then allow the AD bacteria in to access that energy within the plant, so the, the sugars. The next one we have is, is a maize crop, so a conventional AD maize crop that's chopped at, theoretically that's chopped at four mil, which roughly in normal conditions will give us around about six to eight mil average length of cut. Uh, it's been, that actually I think was chopped by a class forager. Uh, we can see there we've got good uh, disturbance of the product. We, we, it's maybe not very easy to see on the picture, but the kernels have been broken open, they've been smeared, so we have good surface area, uh, and that's really important. And then my final picture is just something that we use on some sites, and that's a mobile NRI, NRI sensor. So that, that allows us to do very quick analysis of, of grass silage on sites. Now, the unfortunate thing is they're very, very expensive and a little bit fickle. That unit there is actually £19,000. It's a Denashi General unit, and uh, we need to update that on a regular basis to put curves on it. So that's got preloaded data, which allows us to analyze a range of energy crops. Um, uh, and that's a really useful tool. And it's the same technology which are fit on forage harvesters um, for analyzing um, crops as they come in. So energy cropping, um, again, I could probably spend a whole presentation talking about energy cropping. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I'm just gonna look at what, what's involved at the sites I work with in, in energy cropping. And depending on the site, a lot of it depends on the philosophy of the business. So if that business is just buying energy crop, they will generally have a different outlook than a, a business which is growing the energy crop and using it in the AD plant. And, and, and we can see here, um, so some of the pictures I've taken, so these are a mixture. Um, so first of all, when we harvest in, we, we want to harvest at the right time. So in the northwest of England and Scotland, that presents a lot of challenges. That's probably one of the biggest challenges I'm faced with within my job is making or getting operators uh, and, and farming systems and agronomists to make the, to, to, to harvest right. There never really is a right time, especially with grass, because of the time frames involved with harvesting, you know, 600 to 1,000 acres of grass in one go is challenging. It's probably one of the biggest challenges I have. To keep the dry matter within a window and the sugars and the energy density within a window is really, really challenging. And actually what we always try to do which maybe would go against some advice is we always try to aim at the higher level of dry matter because the one thing for sure with, with AD plants and the ones that I work with, they can use drier crops easier than they can use wetter crops. And that just depends on the AD system. Some AD plants work better on some systems and others on others. Um, we've got an example here of ensiling. Again, really important 
um, to, to ensile right. And that's one of the challenges in this big picture here. So we can see there's a lot going on in that picture. Um, that site there had, I think, around about just under 600 acres to lift. We had around about a three day weather window that then reduced to around about 16 to 18 hours. Uh, so fetch, the contractor fetch three forages in. Problem being then is great, wonderful, we can get that in the pit, but we need to get it in the pit right, which means we need a lot of weight on the pit. We want it spread right, we want the air out of it, and we want it down, and we want the chop length right, because there's always a habit to, we're under pressure, let's chop it a left, little bit less shorter, which means the forager can go two or three kilometres faster. And so they're all the challenges which I'm faced with. And then when we move to the top picture, we come back to some principles of agronomy and environmental aspects. And this is, I thought this is a really great picture because maize does get a really bad press in the AD industry uh, against other cropping systems in agriculture. And so I've got an example. I took this uh, a week ago and that's in Dumfrieshire uh, and that's under sown maize and that's actually being grown under a bioplastic. Uh, it was it was sown with a with a grass seed in around about the second week of June, just at the point that the the spray, which had a a, a slug and grass seed um, broadcaster, could get in and cover over the crop. So we put on a a, a, a rye grass. Um, this is the second year where we've done this on sort of a sizable area. So these fields actually slope down the hill. Uh, to, to a road and to a stream. Um, and what we want to do is not have any bare stubbles over winter. And it's actually worked really well for us. Uh, it has been a lot of trial and error with the agronomist and the contractor to get this right. But what this has given us is cover over winter. Uh, and interestingly, you can see probably just in the background of that picture, we have a lot of sheep on there. So we're actually able to bring sheep onto that site now over winter to cap that grass and uh, we get a bit of natural nutrition back into the soil from them and just keep that grass under control through to when that in the spring will go into either back into a grass crop or into maize again. Um, so again, it's working with the farming system. Um, I'll talk a little bit about digest it shortly, um, but it, it, it's, it's all a, a mix of keeping things flowing forward um, environmentally and also what people see this site is, is in a, a fairly rural area, but the housing that it does have around it, uh, people do observe what's going on there. So they look, they smell things, they look at the farming practices, and they get excited when they're leading silage. So it's always really important from a, from a PR perspective to be able to demonstrate um, good farming practices. And for example, on this farm, the, the owner has put in a, a one-way system um, so he's put some roads into the farm itself so that the trailers can go around in a circle. So what we're not doing is having a lot of trailers passing on the road. And if there is other local people using that, then we get into conflict with I got run off the road or et cetera, et cetera. So it just provides a much better working environment and local environment for people local to that site. And just for interest, that site uh, is providing around about enough electricity for between sort of 1,000 and 1,500 homes in Dumfrieshire, depending on what's been used in the national grid locally. So finally, uh, Digestate. And I would love, again, I would love to do a presentation in great depth on Digestate because it's a fascinating product. And um, I could, we could talk about it lots. Um, but fundamentally, really, where I discovered Digestate was so good with just when working with AD plants and seeing it been applied on farms. So when I first started, I've seen it in Germany because I was, I was working with the development of the, um, and of the manure sensing system, which John Deere now have, which is the same as what's used on the forager to look at the, the harvesting sensing. So where you could look at the nutrition and actually the picture in the top right is the local contractor using that system. So we can close loop, so we can see what crops come off the field, grass crops, but also we can measure the NPK going back onto that. So for the agronomy reasons um, and for our farm waste management plans, we can look at what's going back on the fields in them aspects. But when I was working with Digestia, I noticed how well it works and it is absolutely fantastic on agricultural crops. Again, a lot of that does come down to what plant and what the plant is feeding. Certain feedstocks enhance Digestia. So for example, I have some plants using 
uh, I would say small amounts of chicken litter, and they're really good at enhancing the N mineralization levels in the digestive. Um, so back in 2016, 17, when I recognized with my business partner, Alistair, that this was a fantastic product, we, I just sit down and think, well, how can we fetch that into the greater market? So how can I bring that out to, for example, horticulture and the retail? And that was where our journey set off um, with introducing Will Niles plant food. Um, it, it's actually been a, it has been a difficult journey. We've been faced with many regulatory requirements. Um, we still have quite a few things we're doing. I'd love to talk about them, but um, I've got some um, stuff I can't talk about, but it, it is all really good. Um, so digestate has been, has been fantastic for us. Um, and it's important to consider digestate as its individual parts. So digestate whole, depending on the plant, will vary from 2% to 18% dry matter. And you might see that in, in some different AD systems that might be much higher in dry matter. But generally pumpable systems where we have a liquid-based AD plant, it will be between 2 and 18% dry matter. Dry matter. So when that's separated off into its solid product and its liquid product, um, we're left with what's called separated solids and a liquid. And both of them have slightly different applications. For us as Will and Al's, we've had to put both of them through a, a specialised process individually to create a stabilised um, and I would say consumer acceptable product. But from an agricultural perspective, it's so important, or even as a waste plant perspective, to separate it. Digest it as a habit, because it's quite warm, is to separate quite quickly into its solid and its liquid, and then it goes very hard. And that causes a lot of um, problems with operation of AD plants. When we've separated it down, what we find is that the liquid, it, it, generally it has a higher level of NPK in a, in a mineralized form, where the solid product, it generally has it in an organic form. So it needs to go through the process when it's applied to land to mineralize the NP and K. And they really are fantastic products. And the, the interesting thing is, is how do we, as, as an operator of an AD plant, get that, the NPK level to be stable? And that really goes right back to the beginning where I was talking about feedstocks and plant design is, the basics is if you can keep your controlled AD environment steady, you keep your feedstock consistent and your menu, so actually what you feed your AD plant, that is a really important sort of factor in the AD process. Okay, that's my presentation. Now, actually, I apologize. I think I've missed one slide out, but I'll open it up to everybody now to answer questions and if we want to go back through the, the presentation. Okay, thank you, Will. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, there's nothing so far in the chat. I've got a question for you, Will. Yep. Um, Mike Whiting here. Um, Will, um, you, Hi, mentioned, I, I, you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation about some um, qualifications that you did. Yes. Could you tell us a bit more about those? Yeah, so that's, um, I did a, through the commercial waste, Management Institute, I did a, a WAMITAB, which is a, a, a health and safety based course on the on basically health and safety aspects of the operation of an AD plant. So if you have a waste AD plant and it's a, a permitted location under the, the Environment Agency or SEPA, you're required to have a technical competent manager on that site for a percentage of its operational time. Uh, and that's one of the qualifications you can do to, to qualify as a te technical competent manager. And it covers the various aspects of um, plant operation, waste management, feedstock management, digestate management, and health and safety. Um, it was actually a really good course to go through. I did it over a period of two years. It, it was in a way, it was a little bit mundane, quite a few of the things you do. It was a lot of, um, you, you had to have written and then demonstratable work. So you had to demonstrate what you were doing in your, your job role, matched with what you were writing down uh, as part of the qualification. But I found it really useful uh, in understanding some of the aspects which I wouldn't have normally considered in AD. Thanks very much. 
whilst whilst I've got your attention there, what what um, just as a, a another follow up question, with the cost of fertilizer going through the roof, what <laughs> challenges does that pose for uh, AD plants in uh, getting raw materials? Yeah, that that's uh, that's actually something I've been having lengthy discussions with today with uh, various partners, and it's an interesting one because really as my last slide on digest it i think it's it's so important for for ad users to or, or, or energy plant growers is to utilize digest it well uh, and apply it at the right time using the right equipment to get the best energy out of it and it, it is it is the quandary which farming is is faced with at the moment is is fertilizer and pesticide and herbicide costs they're all going to be substantially higher next year um Interestingly, the, the trade-off of that is so is electricity price. I mean, I'm looking at electricity trading prices into 22, 23, and 23, and 24. And that is actually coming back at a higher level than I've been buying it as a, as a residential consumer this year. So that the market on electricity sales is very strong and also gas sales is very strong. So there is a level of offset there, but it will be a difficult challenge and we've seen that in the waste sector one of the big challenges in the waste sector when covid come along was restaurants closed down so a lot of food waste dried up which meant that energy crops went up because there was a demand for it um, and we then get sort of macro challenges locally with with ad plants bidding on certain products and then waste going from gate fee to no gate fee you know well I tell you what, I'll give you 20 quid for that. You need to pay him to take it away. Uh, and and we, we've seen some interesting phenomena with that. And that's always one of the challenges, again, why it's a volatile business. Yeah, thanks, Will. Just, um, if I could ask you, Will, a few questions, really. I, I, I wasn't paying attention closely enough to your first slide. You showed basically a a beautiful concrete yard with an AD plant at the back. And I think you were talking about 120 kilowatt continuous output from that or thereabouts. That's the one. What, what was the level of waste going into that to generate 120 kilowatts? Okay, well, depending on it, on the dry matter of the slurry, you will be around about 18 to 22 tonnes of slurry a day going into that, which is a mixture of slurry. There is some wash waters in that, that. That equates to the sum. It's 40, 40 litres a cow a day, isn't it? It is, days. yeah. And they, they've got a, they've got a, an outlying unit, so it depends on the level of slurry they're going to fetch in and also how, how many, much. How many, I mean, if that was a pure dairy setup, how many cows does that equate to? On that unit, there is, I think they've got around about 400 to 450 right. milking. Then they've got right. followers and fatteners um, and then various others on a, an outlining unit. But they are, that site there is interesting is that they're actually quite sacrificial on their, on their silage pits and their feed. So they would be scraping out the feed passages on a regular basis and putting yeah. it straight into the AD plant. And they would be taking a reasonable level off the shouldering and the topping of, of the silage. So they, they, they're generating, I would say, quite a lot of biogas just from that. Slurry in itself, depending on its dry matter, is not great on energy level. Yeah. Uh, we would, for example, see anywhere from 50 to, to 80 cubes on a, on a slurry unit, oh, sorry, cubes of biogas per fresh tonne. And it, 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 even in that, there, there can be quite variabilities on, on methane level within that itself. So um, that's one of the, the challenges with, the, with any AD system is, especially cyclic seasonalities with, with dairy farming and energy levels in the crop, which they're feeding the cow, they then might have to subsequent maybe a ton of silage into that um, unit a day extra. To, to make up for the shortfall if you know they're going to make up for the shortfall or do they run it at 100 kilowatts an hour for a few weeks until the gas naturally builds back up as they move into a different or a slightly change in the in the in the gas profiling yeah so how i mean that that setup seems to show there's like a silver pipe or a stainless pipe i guess coming yeah. out of the the dome 
neatly feed. I mean, that's the gas pipe, presumably feeding yeah, into. Yeah, it is. So, so th this plant, it's interesting. It's it's it, that has a residence time in its um, of digestion of between, I think, about nineteen to twenty-two days. Yeah. Um, the biogas then will probably have a residence time of just a couple of hours. Um, and it goes up into the ceiling and inside that dome is a, then a secondary dome and then a mesh, a quite wide open mesh. And what happens in there is there's sulfur and ammonia. And what they want to do is they slowly inject a very small amount of oxygen in there, which then stimulates the formation of sulfur. So the hydrogen sulfide will drop out, will, will be taken out of the gas stream to a degree. But actually what you can't see on the picture... And that goes into the digestate then, does it? Uh, no, that's in the roof. So that's bonded to the, the oxygen is injected just above the surface of the digestate. Uh, and, it, and that stimulates the, the transition of hydrogen sulfide to sulfur. Now, right. there, there is a lot of debate whether that's the right way to, to manage hydrogen sulfide. In an AD plant, people put iron oxides in uh, as alternatives. Um, but really, on an economic basis, they, they, this type of plant is built to be quite economical in, in theory. So they want to use natural process of oxygen to manage the biogas quality. Yeah. But what you can't see behind the CHP is a, is a container, which is about, it's a round cylinder, about two meters tall, uh, and that has um, carbon granules in it. And we pass all the biogas, which comes out along the silver pipe, through the carbon, which, which takes out a lot of the um, hydrogen sulfide, which is remaining, and also the particulates in that. And then it passes through a, a condensing chiller unit and then into the engine. Uh, in, in actual sort of technology points, quite a rudimentary setup. Um, it's just a conventional, that's an MAN engine, uh, which you would find in large buses. Yeah. Trucks. Etc. And that one's obviously just that's got a generator on the back of it. It has. So it's got a, a Stanford generator um, and it produces at, at rated it's a hundred kilowatt, 120 kilowatts an hour um, at rated capacity of that plant. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I mean if that's on a direct electricity feed, you need synchronous operation at that engine, don't you? You can't have the thing. I'm yeah, it, so it, right, be, yeah, right behind the cabinet. Um, so if we're looking at the um, we're looking at the unit here, the front end here with the two large doors, we have the CHP. So we have yeah. the engine, and we have the generator, and then behind it we have in the side door here, we have synchronization module um, and transformer. And then we have the PLC and SCADA unit in the back. That then goes off site in the let sorry, it goes out here to the back and then into pole mounted transformer here. So this was a direct connection that the, the local grid and um, DNO put into that site. Uh, so it's a it's a pole mounted um, system. So he, he could potentially probably export to a maximum of say 160 to 180 kilowatts an hour, probably based on that three phase yeah. connection. Okay, thanks. Better let somebody else have some questions. I've got plenty more if nobody else. <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a question coming on the chat. So uh, Tom Copeland, if you're still there, do you want to ask your question? Yes, please. Um, that's grand talk. What's the energy efficiency of these big plants, including the fuel costs, the fertilizer, the building, the plant, the machinery associated with the complete installation? That is a really good question. And actually, I, it would be hard to answer that, to be honest. Um, <sighs> there's so many variabilities in the plants themselves and how the owner operators look to offer to, to operate them. Uh, what type of waste they're bringing in? Are they bringing in waste or the energy crop? And th this is something I feel we'll, we will have to, as an AD industry address in the near future is look at the overall energy efficiency because actually a CHP unit isn't maybe the, easy, the most efficient way of 
using that energy of biogas. Uh, I mean, most of the units there would, which we see would be probably from an electrical perspective, be about 42 to 47% efficient. It will be slightly higher when you use the heat from it. So that depending on their heat use can have a big impact on how efficient that site is. It, and, and again, scale can have both positives and negatives. Some of the, the bigger plants, because of the residence time and the physical size of the AD unit in itself, the AD plant, you do get a greater efficiency of that feedstock which is put into it. So when we look at retention time and biological processing, the bigger the tank, actually biologically more stable the system can be. So there's lots of things to play on that. And then you've got fuel usage. You've got how far does that crop come or how far does that waste come to get into the site? It is a really, really interesting question. And, and I, I couldn't really generalize that. Um, but I suspect as we, we move forward into the future, that's something. And I know electricity wholesalers and brokers are starting to ask them type of questions. Okay, thank you. Then can you actually clean up this gas and extract the, the methane, for example, and use it directly in a fuel cell? Yes, you can. And in an ideal world, I suspect that would be the most efficient way to do it. But at the moment, until very recently, there has been, I would say, financial implications because the subsidy models are set out mainly to generate electricity and then latterly generate gas. There hasn't been a lot of inertia to develop that type of technology, which is in a way disappointing. And we're just starting to see that happening now. So when we look at gas cleaning, so, so as I said in my presentation, buying gas is pretty dirty. Uh, it needs a lot doing to it to get it into a usable form, whether that be biomethane or methane or methane and hydrogen dioxide, sorry, carbon dioxide. So Yes, I, it, is, it is possible, and we are seeing some sites starting to do that, but I, I suspect one of the things that AD has suffered from in the UK is, then this is just my perspective on it, a lot of plants, well, most plants were built on the back of feeding tariff, and that was built on the back of uh, continental technology, which even then was quite dated. So a lot of plants in the UK even though they're relatively, they've been, been built relatively recently, are, are quite dated in their actual design and their processing and their processes. And, and as plants get older and breakdowns occur, they then get refurbished and that improves. But that, that's been sort of one of the stigmas of the AD industry is, is a lot of the technology is old continental technology and we don't see a lot of new technology which allows more cost-effective and more efficient processing of both feedstocks and biogases, essentially. Will, um, can I ask a question? It's Simon here. Yeah. Um, thinking back to the, um, the I Agree conference a few weeks ago, um, there, was, there was a presentation which was, I can't remember the, the, uh, the chappy, his name and, and the company, but it was, it was basically the one that was following on from the um the cnh um the methane methane tractor and that but it was, it was basically sort of where they were harvesting methane from well basically just putting a, a, a lid on a slurry lagoon so it was, a, it was a very sort of passive uh sort of digester really i suppose you could argue uh, and that the the technology which was being used there for um, cleaning the gas or scrubbing it or whatever the, the terminology should be. Um, is that the sort of thing that that could be employed? Because I mean, in, in this sort of system or, you know, is, is what you've got uh, doing the job perfectly well, even though you've got a system which you could argue is, is far more uh, tuned and optimised to producing gas. Um, and it seems that, you, you know, are, are, is there a um, uh, are the two technologies sort of matched or, or not? Um, I, I think they are to a degree, and uh, a lot. Of, I think a lot of the technologies depend on the volume of biogas on on how um, how much is needed to be cleaned as a as a as a cubic meter per hour can have a big effect on the the cost of that. 
and it was really interesting. I, I sat on that presentation. It was really interesting to hear, and, and, and it's something I would like to to see more of because there is a reason for the the picture I've got here on the screen is I really like that type of plant, but I also like the concept which you had there. You know, this is a majority waste plant. It's small. It's quite compact. Why aren't there a lot of these type of units installed on beef units, pig units, dairy units across the UK? You know, we see it in we see it in Germany. We've seen it in Austria. We're now seeing it developing in France. Um, whether it's CHP, I'm not sure because I'm not sure that's the most efficient. But yeah, why why can't we have a lot more of these? Actually, um, there's a lot of dairy farms out there, a lot of beef units. Uh, with a lot of waste, a lot of veg processes as well, where a small AD plant could provide a, a substantial um, gas producing system, basically. Yeah, yeah, thank you all. And thank you, Rodri. Yes, it was the, uh, the uh, Bannerman, Bannerman, or Bannerman. Bannerman. Chris Mann, wasn't it? Yes. Could, just following on from that, then, Will, I mean, the one question. I was tempted to ask Chris Mann, but I didn't because I mean I didn't I didn't want to put a dampener on anything really. I mean, it, for dairy farmers that that fire into this type of investment and this sort of setup, are they then committing or more or less committing to zero grazing? Because the challenge is you need most of the gas to run your tractors in the summer, and if the cows are out, you're not producing the slurry to feed your digester with. Yeah, exactly, and. That so I'm is, not quite sure how that works. Uh, and and, and that, that's exactly the issue I was faced when I was selling AD plants in my previous role is you go to a dairy farm and they were really keen to do something. They had a big dairy unit, but then they put all the cows out in summer. And actually the financial aspects didn't work because AD plants are tariff driven. So the installation cost was generally focused on the tariff, maybe not the technology, which is another yeah. always difficult driver in the macros of, 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 a, of, of a developing industry. And yeah, that, that, is, a, that is an issue and it, it presents itself time and time again. And, but I would focus on actually, when you look at the dairy industry or the beef industry, there is still a substantial amount of units out there which are zero, either zero grazing or um, housed all year round who don't have systems like this. And I think yeah. there's a lot of opportunities there um, for that, but it is, it is a very, it is a difficult, yeah. It, you, if you put that level of investment in, um, so if we look at a plant like I'm looking at on the screen here, back in 2013, I think that would be around about 780,000 of investment with grid connection. Um, Debatable where that would be today because there is very few small AD plants, if any, been built in the UK. Um, but based on what's happened, I wouldn't see that being hugely a big change in that. Possibly there would be another 10, 15 percent price on that, depending on what technology price you technology path. But if you went to a, a CHP, which we've got here, for example, would be round about anywhere from 125 to 225,000 for a new unit and Ofgem would insist that, that they did in that regulation that had to be a new unit you couldn't install a second hand unit um, but if you put a gas scrubbing unit in to scrub the gas not put it through an engine you'd probably be looking at between 900,000 and 1.2 million for that kit to inject into the grid or inject into a into a, a, a gas inject, inject the gas into the gas grid you mean yeah right and, 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 and actually, aside from that, one of the big challenges is I've seen gas grid connections. Um, I've done some myself, ranging from 400,000 to multiples of million. Um, I did a, a grid connection on a 250 kilowatt, as an example, and that came in at 490,000 just for the gas connection without the gas scrubbing, which made that completely uneconomical for the farmer. Yeah, it, it does sort of beg the question, as you say, at the moment, we, we're basically using the gas as a, as a means of producing electricity. But as time moves on, you could argue, well, perhaps there are other easier ways of producing electricity and 
the gas could be used in a better way, you know, displacing what is currently, um, you know, fossil derived gas. Um, uh, and whether the sort of, you know, uh, as the economics and things change, whether whether it will become more more attractive to, uh, or even incentives to sort of go down that route, one wonders. Yeah, it's it's interesting because the latest data or information we've seen on the the gas, the green gas, which I talked about, incentive, doesn't look particularly fruitful for smaller units, um, which is disappointing and is focused really on bigger processes, um, mainly waste processes. So, it, yeah, it, it, it is very challenging that actually, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a diffi it's a difficult one. But a uh, the, the, lot of the sort of finance drivers behind this is the plants which are up and operational, unless there is a huge change in feedstock pricing or waste pricing, they'll be operational for their 20 years under the feed-in tariff scheme. It'll be interesting to know what happens there when it finishes. I have some plants who are nearly 10 years into that now, um, and they're beginning to think, well, what are we going to do in 10 years' time? You know, I've got all this infrastructure. Um, a lot of plants are managed under the EA and SEPA regulation, which means they are maintained at a high level. So they've got a high level of investment costs going into that maintain the engines to keep the emissions where they should be, but also keep the infrastructure in very good condition because they're audited and it can be inspected on that. Uh, so it does pose a really interesting question at the end of the, the 20 years on a lot of these sites, what, what will be the next technology path? Will it be refurbished and repurposed? Well, can I come in on that? Dennis Cardinal. Well, uh, rather flippantly maybe, but. How do you get on with the Extinction Rebellion and people and the like on this? Sorry? Can you... How do you get on with the Extinction, extinction Rebellion types? And uh... <laughs> uh, It's a very emotive subject, actually, I think. But uh, I, I mean, I look at it, and if I think back, and it's something I've asked myself numerous times, so energy crops into AD, but at the end of the day, we, we fed horses to plough fields to make food and but there's always a there's always an argument and a counter argument and I think with AD it has had a checkered history and the the it you know the positives tend to have got lost in the negatives you know AD systems are very good at processing difficult materials to give energy and whether that be waste or byproducts but also actually fundamentally whether people like it or not, AD provides baseload. It provides baseload power, baseload gas into the network when other renewable generators maybe can't function. And that's reflected often in, in the trading price of electricity from these sites because they're renowned to be able to provide electricity in a December day when there's very little sunshine and the wind isn't blowing and it's minus two. So there, there is, there's, there's, there's lots of things which are, are positive and negative towards them, but generally I feel a lot of the, yeah, the, the negatives have, have overtaken the positives when actually you dig down into them. They are fantastic pieces of kit and um, unfortunately they've get lost in them negatives. Okay, so they're not going to come along with their standing knives and cut the dome off them. Um, you hope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, if I was going to, uh, yeah, yeah, you hope that doesn't happen because actually you you would be releasing a lot of very dangerous gases into the atmosphere and, mm -hmm. and, and, and at a great cost. But it is a very it is a very interesting point, and um, yeah, it's it's people's perception, and actually that's one of the hardest things to get across to people when they come to an AD site is. They tend to look at it, maize grown in a field, oh, that's, you know, wash off and all the other all the other negatives that go with it. But actually, um, that maize plant is probably processing a range of other waste products, which would possibly go to landfill or cost a lot of money to process. And that's just part of society is we generate them wastes and we do need to do something with them and do something with them safely. And, and AD prevent, 
provides a real solution to a lot of them wastes. You know, sewerage AD is huge, but very rarely talked about. And, and most utility companies operate large scale AD units. Um, I'm trying to think if I've got a picture. The slide I missed actually here. Um, if that seven trends unit uh, at Nottingham. Stoke Bardolph. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, Stoke Bardolph. And it's a maize fed unit, but, you know, they, they recognize they've got a land which had a lot of contamination on it. They couldn't do anything with it, but they could grow maize on it. And maize is reasonably a, a good use of sunlight in summer. Uh, and the energy which you put back into the soil as a digest it to, to do something, create some power to power that site. So just as an example there. I and mean, oh. that's been there 40, 40 plus years of Stoke Barov. Yeah. Remember and I agree visit there many, many years ago. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah, I worked there a few times over the years. Um, I mean, yeah. as a little a little snippet, and this this central one, which is slightly off topic, is is an example of the negative side of AD and that is a, a large multinational PLC who built several AD plants off a, off a company which had designed a new trend set in AD uh, unit and, and, and actually all them plants worked for a couple of days and then collapsed because the, the biology and the processes didn't work correctly and, and that's an example of where things don't go right and the investment company and the, the multinational lost millions in that process. Um, with several sites across the UK and Ireland. So, Will, um, a bit of a question, if I may. Um, you explained the pressure on the capital cost um, not being offset with feed-in tariffs and uh, RHI. I wonder, going forward, did you see that being solved to some extent by this green incentive? But also, perhaps, um, if... Uh, community energy came into it or a, a lower capital cost design? I, I, th I think fundamentally in AD, a lower capital cost needs to be reflected in future developments. Um, I, I've noticed as the feeding tariff increased back in 2013 14, then the incremental cost of an AD plant increased in line with that. And that's just a typical sort of, we see that in other farm-based subsidies where a piece of equipment suddenly goes up because there's a grant against it. And, and that was really one of the issues with AD is the, the cost went up with the, the rise as the tariff, as the incentive for people to build more plants. The government introduced feeding tariff and it didn't really have too much of an effect. So they started to raise the tariff banding. Then they introduced the heat incentive on, uh, on the back of that in 2014. And that then caused a, essentially a, a rush to the market. And I think as we move forward into the future, we need to use technology better, but also a much lower infrastructure cost. Whether that's possible now in a, in a, in a post-COVID world is, is an interesting one, but. Um, a lot of the plants I work with, they're being subject to quite high installation costs, you know, um, against, against what they, they, can, they can generate successfully. And, and that's another historic problem with AD plants is there were, there were often um, the, the, the financial drivers were calculated at a too higher efficiency than we would expect to achieve from the technology installed. So they generally run at a slightly lower efficiency, which then has quite a big effect on the payback period. And, the, and obviously the, the, the income generation streams from them sites. Uh, and we still, we're seeing a lot of plants are addressing that by fitting new kit. And I'm involved in some projects around that. So that's quite interesting, but it's, it's kind of frustrating that we, we would have liked to have known about that sort of technology 10 years ago when AD first really kicked off in the UK. Um, but interestingly, sewage, sewage AD is it's something which has always been working in the background. Sewage plants tend to have a really high infrastructure cost, but they want them plants to work for generations and generations and generations. And when you go and visit them plants, they're very, very impressive 
you know, in how they function biologically, but also their, you know, sort of their integrity as a, as a, as an operational plant and the lifetimes that, you know, the sort of the life cycles that get off the equipment which are installed. Yeah, thanks for that. There's any examples of locally using the gas, you know, in community energy or anything like that? Or um, I've, uh, There's been a, a couple around me tried to do it, but really the biggest issue has been the ability to put the gas into the local network, but also the, the cost of cleaning that gas. We are seeing that reducing quite substantially, and I've not done a lot of work on new gas scrubbing equipment in the last year. I did some during the first part of COVID, and there was quite a drop in that technology cost from where it was in 2018. So a bit like solar, I, I think we will see that becoming more attainable in small projects. But it, it, it is making sure that when you do a project like that, that if you're going to put gas into a grid locally, that you are you have got the local gas, gas distribution network on board with that, because that's where a lot of projects didn't get off the ground because it was just too expensive to access the grid because of the pressures they're running at. And they're very sensitive to any changes in their grid, uh, either input or output pressures um, I've found. And uh, I think there needs to be a slight mindset change. And then that's happening in the green gas incentive is driving, is supposed to drive change in that industry. Okay, thanks for that, Will. Okay, any more for any more? Yeah, they, they, I'll just add, if you're all on, is this is a slide I missed off, so I do apologise for it. And, and actually, one of the most important things we have here is uh, in AD, there's generally two temperatures which AD plants operate at, and that's mesophilic and thermophilic. Uh, and mesophilic is, a, is, a, is a, from a temperature range of 22 to around about 42 degrees, with thermophilic at 43 to 60. There was quite a lot of debate within that because certain bacteria work at certain different temperatures so academics will write that maybe mesophilic is 25 to 38 degrees for example but they are generally the two sort of ranges which all the different plant designs we see operate at and so the fundamental differences between them in temperature ranges mesophilic if i was to summarize it in a simple principle mesophilic is is generally easier to operate and easier biological to manage where thermophilic you can see slightly higher performances on gas yielding uh, and breakdown of feedstocks, but actually are a lot more fickle from a biological perspective. Um, but thermophilic is good at, um, how would we say, uh, processing more of the more dangerous or the more difficult waste streams. So uh, getting a level of pasteurization as well from that. Can I just ask, Will, you've got two different temperatures there. You've got a problem of keeping these things warm. Can you have a central chamber doing the thermophilic surrounded by mesophilic and actually transfer your digestate through from one position to the next? So that's, a, that's a really good point because actually the, the, this, this plant here, you see in the picture, um, which is this one here when it was been built wrapped in the insulation, is, is a thermophilic sorry it's a mesophilic plant and it has a it's a it's a tank with a with a tank inside it and the 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 they call it a primary digester and then a secondary digester and some of them plants will work between them two ranges so you will find almost a thermophilic bacteria in the outer ring and because the heat is get concentrated into the middle just with the concrete mass and how things work you find that the inner might be working at thermophilic so we do see that phenomenon on some plants but we also see especially on high grass loading in certain parts of the summer we will see plants go from mesophilic into thermophilic through the exothermic reaction when you're feeding grass silage and yeah, it's a strange phenomenon but I, I do see that that i have some plants which migrate from mesophilic into thermophilic um, it's when you go back down into mesophilic in the autumn that things get a little bit fruity at times with the, the, the biological management of them plants. But yeah, you, you essentially it's a, it can be a useful tool that, depending on your feedstock. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, 
It's an interesting point on plant design, actually. The plants with gas bags on the top are a little bit more challenging to keep warm because you get a lot of parasitic loss of heat because essentially it's a, almost an uninsulated gas bag on the roof where, for example, this plant here has a, has a concrete ceiling insulation and then a layer of gravel. So the parasitic loss of heat is minimal. Um, so they're much easier. So I find that on plants which are exposed, certainly in parts of Scotland to wind chill, they do have problems with maintaining bacterial count and can suffer a, a degree of performance loss if they're subject to wind chill and you can't keep the heat in the plant. Right, so I think, well, we're, we're approaching, uh, approaching nine o'clock anyway, so I think uh, we'll perhaps draw the, the uh, talk to, a, to a, a formal close, if you like, but uh, obviously if Will's willing and the, the audience wants to sort of chat along afterwards, we can uh, stay on for a little bit. Um, so first of all, Will, thank you very much for your most entertaining and interesting uh, uh, talk and I'm sure the uh, the audience you know will uh, you know echo my uh, my thoughts and feelings there so thank you very much Will um, and I'll just while I've still got the, um, the, the the floor as you might say is to remind folks of uh, next month's meeting which is scheduled for the 18th of January and uh, that's going to be a presentation on the conservation of architectural metalwork. So quite a, a, a different sort of story. Uh, and that's been presented by uh, Robert Turner. So uh, hopefully we will uh, all be able to sort of gather and uh, reconvene for, for that.